Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to 1812 Channel. Today I have a short review for you of The Astonishing General, The Life and Legacy of Sir Isaac Brock by Wesley B. Turner. Hmm, <laughs> wonder what it's about. <laughs> I think the title says it all. Now, a friend of mine recommended The Astonishing General as a newer, if not the best, biography of Sir Isaac Brock, commander of British forces at both Detroit and Queenston Heights, and a national hero in Canada. The author, Wesley B. Turner, had been a high school teacher and was a professor at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, when I was a student there from 1975 to 1979. But honestly, I, I have no memory of him. I do have rather vivid memories of another history professor, DJ Goodspeed, but that's a story for another time. Now, in his preface, Turner explains his use of the word astonishing in the title. Quote, With the approaching bicentenary of the War of 1812, this book was written in 2011, there is growing interest in all aspects of that war, its participants and victims, and its legacies. One of the most enduring legacies on both the United States and Canadian side was the creation of heroes and heroines. The earliest of these heroic individuals was Major General Isaac Brock, who, in some ways, was the most unlikely of heroes. For one thing, he was admired by his American foes almost as much as by his own people. Even more striking is how a British general whose military role in that two-and-a-half-year war lasted less than five months, became the best-known hero and one revered far and wide. I find this outcome to be astonishing and approach the subject from that point of view. This concentration on Brock should not diminish anyone's admiration of other historic figures. Tecumseh, John Norton, Oliver Hazard Perry, Winifred Scott, and Laura Secord, to mention a few. Compared to them, however, the way Brock acted and what he achieved in so short a time were so unexpected that I believe the appropriate term for them is astonishing. End of quote. Turner's preface outlines what we will read in the upcoming pages. Here are the main points. 1. Brock was born into an upper-class family from the Isle of Guernsey, a family not without its troubles. 2. He had purchased most of his commands up to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel when he became commander of the 49th Regiment. 3. His previous combat record, one battle, was unimpressive. 4. He then spent 10 years in Canada performing administrative duties up until the outbreak of the War of 1812. 5. Thus Brock only came to real prominence during the last year of his life, defending a population largely born in the USA against an American invasion. 6. In spite of his upper-class origins, Brock was a man with the common touch who showed concern for the needs of the troops under his command. 7. He effectively led both regular troops and militia and cooperated successfully with native warriors such as Tecumseh. 8. He made intelligent use of psychological warfare and used these skills to defeat a much stronger, in terms of troops, a much stronger opponent. 9. As a major general, 
Brock only participated in two battles. In the first, he beat an opponent who may have been suffering a mental collapse, and in the second, he died early in the battle while he was losing. In the rest of the book, Turner chronicles the world into which Brock is born, his youth and family background, his early years in the army, which include being wounded in action, his time in Canada prior to the War of 1812, and his actions at both Detroit and Queenston. Brock's sole combat experience took place in 1799 as part of the wars against Napoleon. Quote, In 1799, under Sir Ralph Abercrombie, an English force landed on the Dutch shore near the little town of Helder. Advancing southward, they fought against French and Dutch opposition until the beginning of October when they were ready to assault Bergen. His, Brock's, regiment was in the right column, whose task was to attack Egmont op Zee. In a letter to his brother John, he told how, when the enemy threatened to turn his regiment's flank, he led a charge across the sand dunes that threw his opponents into disorder and forced them to retreat. He made light of a wound he received. Ha! I got knocked down soon after the enemy began to retreat, but never quitted the field and returned to my duty in less than half an hour. Officers frequently wore cravats, usually made of silk, around their throats, and in Brock's case, the ball had penetrated a cotton handkerchief and a black silk cravat, but no further. This short, rather confused clash was his only experience of participating in combat before August the 15th, 1812. End of quote. Turner does a credible job of outlining Brock's life, but the book title mentions Brock's legacy as well. In the final chapter, the author asks why we still remember Brock. I went to a university named for him, after all. Why we still remember Brock when so many others from the War of 1812 have been relegated to the Dust Bowl of history. Here I'm not sure that Turner is successful, but it may be an impossible task. So why do we remember Brock? Allow me to offer a few thoughts, a few of largely my thoughts. One, Brock died a winner. Turner notes the popular perception that Brock died undefeated. Quote, it seemed that more than anyone else, Brock saved Upper Canada from conquest and occupation, for he was seen as the victor at Detroit and even at Queenston. Under subsequent commanding generals, the province experienced military defeat, severe losses among the troops and militia, widespread destruction, shortages, and enemy occupation. Generals such as Schaeff, Proctor, Rottenberg, and Drummond could be held responsible for failures, but not Brock. His record was perceived as unblemished. End of quote. Two, Brock died young, in his prime, and there is a tendency to attach halos to such people. Just think JFK. Uh, that's uh, President John F. Kennedy for you younger listeners. After all, the expression is, only the good die young. <laughs> I guess that's why I'm living to a ripe old age. Point number three. Brock was an attractive personality. He was a good-looking man who stood well over six feet at a time when the average soldier was little more than five feet tall. At 43, he is described as portly, but that was considered far more agreeable back then 
than it is in our modern anorexic age. Brock had a warm and engaging personality, and while he could be a strict disciplinarian, he cared about the men under him and tried to improve their lot. Turner writes of Brock's action on learning that some deserters and mutineers from his regiment, the 49th, have been shot following court-martial. Quote, When Brock received the news of the executions, he ordered the garrison of Fort George under arms and read them the letter. Then he spoke to the men. Since I have had the honor to wear the British uniform, I have never felt grief like this, as it pains me to think that any members of my regiment should have engaged in a conspiracy which has led to their being shot like so many dogs. His evident concern for his men, while still maintaining discipline, suggests one of his great gifts as a commander. It is likely that the men and officers of the 49th would long remember that emotional scene. End of quote. Point number four. Brock quickly became a folk hero and the subject of a number of folk tales. Now, I used to be involved in storytelling, and I was always disappointed at the lack of Canadian folk tales. The United States seems to be more of a nation of storytellers than Canada. I mean, look at all the tall tale heroes the U.S. has. And what does Canada have? Big Joe Mufferlaw? I mean, Paul Bunyan may have his roots in Quebec, but he is now very much an American hero. But reading Turner's biography, some of the anecdotes about Brock sounded a lot like hero folk tales to me. For example, Turner relates the story of Brock's confrontation with another officer, a crack shot who challenges him to a duel. Quote, Being tall, Brock knew that he would present an easy target at the usual distance apart of 12 paces. As they prepared for the duel, he demanded that they meet on equal terms. His answer was to produce a handkerchief and insist they fire across it at each other. Not surprisingly, his antagonist declined and soon after left the regiment. Whether or not this actually happened, it suggests that from an early age, Brock had acute insight into what others, particularly opponents, were thinking and how they might respond to determined action. He was to apply this trait very effectively in 1812, both before and after the war broke out. I.e., think of the Battle of Detroit. Another yarn features Brock wisely settling a dispute between two groups of villagers over the naming of their community. In the end, they actually decide to name it after Brock, as in Brockville, Ontario. You know you've really made it when you become a folk hero. And lastly, and this is my opinion, not an idea presented by Turner in his biography, Brock became the personification of the superiority of British governance and institutions. After all, look how easily he and the British regulars and the loyal Canadian militia defeated the Yankee rabble. I believe one of the central figures behind the elevation of Isaac Brock to Canadian hero was the Reverend John Strawn, a leading member of what became known as a family compact. Interestingly, Turner notes that Brock was instrumental in arranging for Strawn's appointment as the officiating minister of the Church of England at York. It is my belief that Strawn would be instrumental in the lionizing of Brock. Hey, <laughs> what goes around comes around. Some of the most interesting parts of the Astonishing General are the appendices at the end. 
They are A, timeline of Brock's life. B, Brock's speeches to the legislature. C, proclamations by Holland Brock. D, biography of significant individuals. And E, inventory of Brock's estate and purchases. In case you're wondering, the sales from Isaac Brock's estate brought in some 843 pounds, the largest buyer being Major General Roger Schaefe. These details seem almost ironic, considering the money problems Brock experienced and which are documented in the book. The Astonishing General concludes with extensive notes and bibliography. My rating, 4.25 out of 5. While Brock's place in the Canadian psyche may not be wholly explained, and no doubt it may be an impossible task, the details of his life and military career certainly are. If you're interested in Sir Isaac Brock, I suggest you begin your search here. The Fall of Detroit, August the 16th, 1812. Note, the history of this non-battle is covered in most books on the War of 1812. In this video, I will be relying mainly on the account from The Astonishing General, The Life and Legacy of Sir Isaac Brock by Wesley B. Turner. On August the 13th, General Brock had arrived at Fort Malden in present-day Emmitsburg, Ontario, after a grueling week-long trip from York, present-day Toronto, primarily by small boats in rough weather. He immediately calls a council of war, at which occurs his famous meeting with the Shawnee leader, Tecumseh. Tecumseh, who reportedly turns to his followers to give his opinion of Brock, Quote, this is a man. Because of the documents captured during the seizure of the American ship Cuyahoga Packet on July the 2nd, supplemented by further papers captured by Tecumseh during the skirmish at Brownstown on August 5th, Brock is well aware of the dissension and low morale of the U.S. troops under the command of a Brigadier General William Hall. After his proposal to cross the river and attack Fort Detroit is seconded by Lieutenant Colonel Robert Nickel, Quartermaster General of the Militia, Brock makes up his mind to attack. During this meeting, Tecumseh, quote, taking a roll of elm bark and extending it on the ground, drew forth his scalping knife, and with the point presently edged upon the back, a plan of the country, its hills, woods, rivers, morasses, and roads, a plan which was fully as intelligible as if a surveyor had prepared it. End of quote. Turner notes that while the above incident may never have happened, it does illustrate the working relationship between Tecumseh and Brock. A battery consisting of three guns and two mortars had been constructed across from Fort Detroit by Captain Hall of the Provincial Marine, and once completed, on August the 15th, Brock demands Hull's immediate surrender. But Hull refuses, and the battery opens fire. The Americans will return fire, but without result. Hull had materially weakened his position, largely for political reasons. On August the 14th, in order to remove some officers who were plotting against him, Hull had ordered 350 of the Ohio militia under Colonels Lewis Cass and Duncan MacArthur to go to the River Raisin in order to escort a stalled supply column to Detroit. The militiamen 
are ordered back to Detroit that same night, but dally and are not a serious factor in the upcoming confrontation. Not that Hull has much luck with the regular army either. He posts Colonel Josiah Snelling in command of a gun at Spring Wells, south of Detroit, the most likely British landing spot. But Snelling withdraws without orders on the 16th, leaving the place undefended. Why he did this, I do not know, but as a result, the British landings are unopposed. On the evening of the 15th slash 16th, 600 native warriors under Tecumseh and Colonel Matthew Elliott, District Superintendent of the Indian Department, cross the river and begin circling through the woods to create the impression of far greater numbers. Brock, having read Hull's correspondence, and thus his mind, well knows the American commander's fear of a massacre by native warriors. He even concludes his demand for surrender with the ominous words, quote, The force at my disposal authorizes me to require of you the immediate surrender of Fort Detroit, it is far from my inclination to join in a war of extermination, but you must be aware that the numerous body of Indians who have attached themselves to my troop will be beyond control the moment the contest commences. End of quote. Yikes! Brock's force of 700 men with two three-pound guns and three six-pound guns cross in the morning, landing at, <laughs> you guessed it, Spring Wells. The 300 militiamen under Brock's command are clad in discarded redcoats from the 41st Regiment to create the impression of a larger body of regular troops. The invasion is supported by the provincial marine ships Queen Charlotte and General Hunter. Brock's initial plan was to use his artillery to lure Hull's forces from the fort for a direct confrontation, but on hearing a rumor that Colonel MacArthur and 500 men were only three miles away and approaching the fort, Brock decides on an immediate attack. It is a desperate plan, as the fort was a strong defensive position and Brock, in his red uniform at the head of his troops, would have been a tempting target for its 24-pound guns. And then the unthinkable happens. Hull surrenders. Pierre Burton describes what happens as the disintegration of William Hull. Prior to the War of 1812, William Hull had been a revolutionary war hero serving as governor of Michigan Territory. He said he had declined to command the Northwestern Army when the post had been offered to him, and that he had told the U.S. government that it needed command of Lake Erie in order to win the war, <laughs> which turned out to be true. But for whatever reason, Hull was to accept the command in April 1812, when he was 59 years old, and recovering from a stroke suffered the previous year. Source, The War of 1812, Conflict for a Continent, by J.C.A. Stagg. As Brigadier General, Hull can best be described as a, uh, vacillating ditherer, ditherer, who quickly loses the respect of the regulars and militia under his command although many of the men in the army are poorly led, poorly fed, and insubordinate. What I'm trying to say is that Hull has no reason to have confidence in them either. It is a recipe for disaster, and it ends in one. Turner quotes J.C. A. Stagg's description of Hull's lurid behavior during the battle for Detroit. Quote, Thereafter, 
possibly under the influence of alcohol and narcotics, combined with the effects of his earlier stroke, his, i.e. General Hall's, behavior became increasingly disordered. His speech became indistinct. He dribbled incessantly, and he took to crouching in the corners of the fort. End of quote. Was Hull having another stroke? I pose that as a serious question. In his biography of Brock, The Astonishing General, Wesley B. Turner suggests the following reasons for Hull's capitulation. One, that Brock and Tecumseh's subterfuge leads Hull to believe the army confronting him is three times its actual size leads him to believe he is outnumbered. 2. Hull has no idea where the hell MacArthur and Cass are, and if they are coming to the rescue. They're not. 3. The effectiveness of British artillery fire. One shot even kills the unfortunate Lieutenant Porter Hanks, awaiting court-martial for having surrendered Fort Mackinac. So effective and intimidating, Hull refuses to fire back. And lastly, fear of massacre. The Americans were afraid of massacre by native warriors, a fear Brock plays upon. And Hull is not just afraid for the people in the fort, which include his daughter and grandchildren, but for the people of Michigan Territory as well. Perhaps Hull was remembering his own proclamation to the people of Upper Canada when he stated, quote, No white man found fighting by the side of an Indian will be taken prisoner. Instant destruction will be his lot. End of quote. Well, what goes around may come around. Hull had dispatched an officer with a flag of truce to the Canadian side of the river and ordered a white flag hung over the fort. The officer returns, as only Brock has the authority to call a ceasefire. And so Colonels Elijah Brush and James Miller are sent to make what terms they can. And thus, 2,188 men, including the men with Cass and MacArthur, are surrendered. Brock allows the militiamen to return to their homes, but the 582 regulars, including Hall, are sent as prisoners to Quebec City. It was a coup de main on the part of General Brock, who with one dare changed the entire course of the war. I believe the fall of Detroit ultimately led to two separate conclusions. One, Canada becoming a separate country, separate from the U.S. No victory at Detroit, no Canada, or at least no Ontario. And two, the continuation of the war, for the Americans now had to retake Michigan. And hence, another year of war and of death. As for Hull, he would eventually be tried by court-martial and found guilty of cowardice and neglect of duty. He is sentenced to death, but is pardoned by President Madison and spends the remainder of his life justifying his conduct. He will die in 1825. But... But... But was Hull correct to surrender? The surrender prevented bloodshed and loss of life, at least for a time. A video on the YouTube channel, The Lenawi or Lenawi Trekker, a video called Elizabeth Park, The Battle of Magagua, link in description, asks the question, was Hull a traitor, coward, or visionary? What do you think, dear listeners? Please share your thoughts in the comments below.
A very brilliant affair. The Battle of Queenston Heights, October the 13th, 1812. Here, as promised so very long ago, is my video on the Battle of Queenston Heights. And what better way to discuss the battle than to review the very brilliant book, A Very Brilliant Affair, by the late Robert Malcolmson. Robert Malcolmson was a native of St. Catharines, Ontario, my Canadian hometown, and the author of several books on the War of 1812, including Lords of the Lake, The Naval War on Lake Ontario, 1812 to 1814. He was also an elementary school teacher and sadly has passed away since this book was published in 2003. The book opens with the 1853 unveiling of the second and current iteration, iteration, the current iteration of Brock's Monument, which is situated on the former battle site. And if you grew up in southern Ontario, like I did, you visited the monument, perhaps as part of a school trip, like I did, and you climbed to the top to look out over the former battlefield, like I did. And uh, how many steps is it? Malcolmson tells us in his appendix, Brock's Monument and Queenston Heights Today, that there are 235 steps. Well, I climbed them once when I was about 12. Today? Today? Forget about it! A statue of General Brock sits atop the monument, just above the viewing area, which gives the monument a height of 185 feet. At the time of its construction, it was the second tallest monument in the world, the tallest being Sir Christopher Wren's monument to the Great Fire of London, which topped it at 202 feet. It's appropriate that Malcolmson opens with the monument, as his book will tell the story of why the monument came to be erected, the Battle of Queenston Heights, October the 13th, 1812. As you can see from the date, the Battle of Queenston Heights took place within the opening months of the war, and the opening chapters cover the events of the war on the Niagara frontier during the dramatic summer of 1812. As many readers will have never visited the Niagara, the book begins with a section on the geography and settlement of the area, a chapter which had me feeling really homesick. Darn you, Robert. For those of you who have never been to the region, the battle will be largely fought on the Niagara Escarpment, where it towers some 300 feet above the village of Queenston, then Upper Canada, now Ontario. The village of Queenston lies across the Niagara River from Lewiston, New York, while the Niagara River itself winds 35 miles, burying the waters of Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, which lies some 326 feet below Lake Erie. Queenston and the Heights are just north of the world-famous Niagara Falls, where the river makes its most precipitous descent. The next two chapters explore the hurried preparations for war on both the national, i.e. Washington and Quebec, and the local level, for on both sides of the Niagara River, things are tense. British Commander Isaac Brock is frustrated by orders from his superior, Sir George Prevost, to refrain from offensive action as he believes he could make a preemptive strike on the American Fort Niagara and possibly drive the U.S. out of the war. Brock has a limited number of British regulars to defend against a superior number of American troops 
who can strike anywhere along the front. Although he suspects the attack will be against Fort George at the mouth of the river where it feeds into Lake Ontario and which lies directly across from Fort Niagara. And Brock also has limited faith in the local militia, his native allies, indeed, in the entire local population. In New York State, it's even worse. American Command has devolved upon a wealthy patroon named Stephen Van Rensselaer, a worthy gentleman, but no soldier. His chief military advisor is his cousin, Lieutenant Colonel Solomon Van Rensselaer, a former officer in the regular U.S. Army and a prickly character, more adept at making enemies than making invasion plans, and who is struggling with the after-effects of a terrible domestic tragedy, the murder of one of his children, a boy of six. As a member of the Federalist Party, Stephen Van Rensselaer had been against the declaration of war, but was maneuvered by his political opponent, Republican Daniel D. Tompkins, governor of New York, into accepting the commission. Van Rensselaer plans to run against Tompkins for governor in 1813. If he had turned down the commission, Tompkins could have labeled him as pro-British, while his acceptance implies tacit support for the war. Malcolmson outlines the moral and logistical problems confronting Stephen Van Rensselaer's army, but the old patroon has yet another problem. A horse's ass named Alexander Smythe. Smythe was a brigadier general in the regular army who appears to have felt insulted by having to serve under Van Rensselaer's command. He and his troops will remain at Black Rock near Buffalo and across from Fort Erie. He even refuses to meet with Van Rensselaer, and this lack of cooperation will have disastrous results. Thus, even reinforcements are no help to Van Rensselaer, but Hull's surrender and the fall of Detroit puts pressure on him to do something. After an abortive attempt to cross the river on October 11th, Van Rensselaer's forces will try again on the 13th. The 13th, which will have unlucky results for both the Americans and for General Brock himself. The Americans set out just after 4 a.m., their embarkation point, the old portage landing a mile south of Lewiston, and they land on a strip of shingles just south of Queenston. Spotted on their way over the river, the Americans have already taken casualties, the most serious being Solomon Van Rensselaer, who is hit multiple times and is shortly out of the fight. The American landing soon begins to collapse in both confusion and disorganization. But in spite of this, a detachment under Captain John E. Wool of the 13th U.S. Regiment scales a steep path up the side of the escarpment and captures the British battery on the heights above Queenston giving the American forces the upper hand. General Brock, who had been sleeping at Fort George, arrives at Queenston around 7 a.m. after an exhausting ride of seven miles over the muddy roads. While Brock knew an American attack was coming, he didn't know where. Brock believes the assault on Queenston may be a feint, and with characteristic energy, he goes and sees for himself. Discovering that the Americans now held the battery overlooking the town, Brock decides to dislodge them. Bad idea. Bad, bad idea. 
With a force of around 50 men, Brock charges up the escarpment to retake the battery. Brock is 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", in an era when the average man is a bit over 5 feet in height, and he is also wearing a bright scarlet uniform. Brock is shot dead. British command devolves upon Major General Roger Schaefe, who will lead a force of regulars and militia, including Iroquois warriors from the Grand River under John Norton, a force that will drive the Americans from the summit and lead them to surrender. Thus, Roger Schaefe, not Isaac Brock, was the true victorious general in the Battle of Queenston Heights. But despite all the miscues, the Americans might have won if reinforced by their militia. Militia, who refused to cross into Canada after seeing the dead and wounded being returned to the New York side and after hearing the cries of Norton's Iroquois warriors. Nevertheless, it is a Pyrrhic victory, for Brock is dead. Appropriately enough, Robert concludes with an epilogue on the building of Brock's monument, doubly appropriate as the book opens with the monument's dedication ceremony. Now, this has been a very rough outline of both book and battle, but a very brilliant affair offers up a wealth of information. Among the maps are six which outline the phases of the battle from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. and illustrate exactly what happened and would be especially useful if you live in the area or are visiting the battle site. Other appendices cover the personnel and order of battle for both sides, as well as the last words of General Brock. In addition, there is a valuable glossary which explains much of the military terminology used throughout the book. It's impossible to do this impressive book justice in such a short review as this, but it does a masterful job of explaining the personalities, the terrain, and the fighting on that October day in 1812, and how the survivors chose to remember the battle through the erection of Brock's monument. It is also a beautifully written book that was a pleasure to read, but sadly, Robert Malcolmson is no longer with us. Let this book and his other works on the War of 1812 serve as his monument. My rating? 4.5, which is near classic status in terms of my rating system. But if you've read the book, what do you think, dear listeners? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If this is your first visit to 1812 channel, my name is Warren and I'm your host. I'm not a historian, nor am I an expert on the War of 1812. Instead, I'm a student wishing to learn about the conflict. Each month for the roughly three years of the war, I will outline the major events, and, <laughs> and I'll also try to review a book on the war, although I might be a little tardy, a little late. Did I miss anything today? Any errors? Then let me know in the comments below. When the barrage lifts, cheers! Pictures used in today's video, courtesy of Pix Here, that's P X Here and show Fort George, and the ubiquitous Canada Goose. While the music was intrepid by that patron of the internet, Kevin MacLeod. Intrepid, which kind of has a spaghetti western kind of vibe. 
but I thought it was appropriate for a video which largely concerns itself with the topic of memory. Thanks for the memories, Warren.